Hello, I'm Kelly Burley with KOSU, and it is a real treat today to be joined by Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, astrophysicist and director of the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, holder of numerous degrees, author of numerous books, and host of Nova Science Now on PBS. Neil, welcome to Oklahoma State Thank University. Thank you. Thank you. You, sir, have an... In Everything is orange, by the way, I noticed. Is this uh, it's the I use my, here. Uh, my careful, you know, faculties <laughs> of observation to notice this, right? <laughs> well, you, sir, have an infectious passion for science, and I'd like to just ask, where did that passion begin? I was nine years old, I, and my parents would take... I grew up in New York City, and every weekend my parents would take my brother and my sister and, and me to, uh, to museums, uh, sporting events, the opera, just stuff, stuff, the offerings of the city. And I, ostensibly it was to just get us out of the house, but I think the subtext was maybe you might stumble on something that would interest you. And so at age nine, a uh, first visit to the local planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium, where I'm now director of the place. But that encounter with the night sky, a night sky I'd never seen in my life, that cities don't have relationships with the night sky. You don't see the stars, the buildings are tall, the lights are bright, and at the time there was more air pollution. So I didn't know anything about the night sky, and there it was just pouring down off the dome, and I was hooked ever since. It's as though the universe called me, like I had no choice in the matter. So since age nine, and so if you'd asked me when I was a kid, what do you want, you know, because adults always do this, right? What do you want to be when you grow up, you know? If you, beginning like age 10 or 11, once I understood that you could do it professionally, I would answer you, I want to be an astrophysicist. Well, tell me, what, what was the transformation for Neil deGrasse Tyson, the expert, to Neil deGrasse Tyson, the communicator uh, for, for science for the 21st century? I, well, I can answer that several ways. One of them puts sort of an obligation back on my colleagues that when we study the universe, we're using tax-based sources of money. The National Science Foundation, NASA, and so you have the right and we have the obligation to, to bring to you, you have the right to know and we have the obligation to bring to you the moving frontier for our understanding of the universe. And if we don't, we're irresponsible in our duties as tax-based scientists, if you will. So that's the first. One is just an obligation. The second one is if I, if I have to do it, I, why not try to be as good as you can at it? I mean, why not? I mean, I'm, a, I'm an academic, and academics try to be really good at stuff. So I remembered my first appearance on national television. It was NBC Nightly News. A new planet had just been discovered orbiting another star. And they came, and I gave them my best professorial reply. And all that, all that showed up was like this little sound-bitten piece of me that night. And I said, oh, that's how that works. Uh, I'm, they're not actually showing me in my element. They want me to participate in their element, in their concept of the delivery of information. So I said, I saw, from then on, I worked on sound bites. So right now, you could like pluck anything out of the universe, Saturn, black holes, quasars, rings, the uh, asteroids, and I will, in my head, formulate a piece of tasty information that's informative, that's the goal. Tasty, informative, maybe it makes you smile, but juicy enough so that you want to tell somebody else and get that done in like two or three sentences. And I started that, and then the press just kept coming back. And I said, oh, I must be feeding them exactly what they need and what they want for their media. And so that's how it began. Just trying to be as good as I could at it, and they, they just kept coming back for more. Because of your knowledge base, do you ever run into the situation of presenting too much information on a particular topic? I mean, how do you know um, what the masses are going to understand versus what you know? So that's an important question. And the trick is, and it's not even a trick, it's just you just got to pay attention to the monitor the attention span of your audience. And not enough professors do that. Not enough lecturers do that. They'll just talk, and people could be falling asleep or escaping the back hatch and then oblivious to it. I try to monitor people's attention span with every word that comes out of my mouth, every sentence, so that if they get sleepy or they glaze over, you have to first know how to 
recognize that, all right? So, so but once you do, you, 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 you filter or you shape what you say and how you say it in a way that's maximally interesting to the audience. And so I'd like to believe that I'm, I know when somebody's falling asleep. <laughs> And, and I'll know uh, that's too much information. Let me pull back a little. Let me adjust it a little. Let me, let me make it a little more interesting. Sometimes what, all it takes to make something interesting is to reach in for sort of pop culture references that matter to the audience. And so there's some TV shows I watch simply to be equipped to make pop culture references. I think of that as my pedagogical utility belt. <laughs> you sort of pull out that and pull out this. And if they're kids, you need sort of a different toolkit for kids than you do for adults, than you do for people who are sort of already enthusiastic about the subject, then you can take them to new places. So you got to know your audience, otherwise you just go home. Just, what are you doing? Now is there one particular issue or topic that you would like to drill down uh, deeper into? Um, what would that be? I, well, the whole universe is a pretty cool place and I'd like, I would sit here for weeks and just go everywhere in the universe, but I, if I had one message it would be that to be more scientifically literate is better than to be less scientifically literate. In this, the 21st century, where innovations in science and technology is going to determine who leads the century and who doesn't. I think here in America, we've been sort of coasting on investments made before us, saying, yeah, we're at the top and we're at the front and we're at the, take a look around. That, 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 that delusion is what used to be fact and is now becoming delusion is going to catch up with us eventually. It's already catching up with us. And as we recede to insignificance on the world stage. So as a scientist and as an educator, science literacy matters to me because so much can be lost without it. In fact, you say that our investment um, in science literally uh, is a make or break for our, our cult. Our our culture. Our, our self-identity. I mean, if you didn't do science, let's say you just did art, okay? That's fine. Then we'd be known for our art, let's say. But you're not leading the world economically because the engines of economic growth we've known since the Industrial Revolution, the engines of economic growth turn on your investments in science, engineering, and technology. Without it, you're a different kind of country. But I can tell you that if we stop doing it, we will turn into a country that's dip, that is something other than what our parents had envisioned for ourselves and something other than what our self-image is as a nation, a nation that leads the world. And uh, uh, today, uh, there, there's plenty of evidence that shows that uh, American uh, school children are lagging behind their counterparts in other countries. A lot of what, people what's, worry, what's the problem? What's the fix? A, a lot of people worry about school children. I'm also worried about adults. Adults far outnumber children. Adults vote. Adults pay taxes. Adults run the country. So here I have adults who are scientifically illiterate saying, what about the children? I'm saying, what about you? All right, and so I'm, I'm, I think it's the whole package. It's the whole package. The thing with kids is that they're born curious about their environment. That's all a scientist is. A scientist, hey, I wonder what this, I wonder what's under here. I wonder how this works. I wonder, that's what scientists and children do that. And sometime between when you're a kid and when you're like a teenager, some of that gets just get beaten out of you. You know, they say you spend the first years teaching your kids to walk and talk and the rest of their lives telling them to shut up and sit down. You know, it's a, at some point you need to figure out how to nurture this sort of built-in, I think, genetic disposition to explore. And so really what adults need to do is get out of the way of the kids and then pick up a book themselves. Then we, then, then we can start talking. Let's talk about your inspirations, Carl Sagan. Yeah, actually I was, I was already interested in the universe before I met him. So it's, it's not like he inspired me to become an astrophysicist, but what did happen was I met him when I was in high school, applying to colleges, and he was a professor at Cornell. I'd been accepted at Cornell, and I was deciding, well, where, what school will I choose to go to? He, my application to Cornell ended up in his office. Somebody at the admissions office must have figured that, let's get, you know, let's spread this around. Because my application, it was clear. I, I've known since I was nine that I wanted to study the universe. So you know my application to college is dripping with the universe. 
So he invited me up. He sent a, ha a hand letter to my apartment saying, come on up and check out the campus and just help you decide if you want to attend. I'm thinking, is Carl Sagan, he's the same guy? Is this? And uh, he met with me, he invited me into his office. He reached back on the shelf and pulled out one of his books. And signed. I thought that was so cool. He didn't have to look, you know, just kind of reached <laughs> and pulled. I said, wow, that's just so cool. He gave me a tour of the lab and I was, uh, to this day, I didn't end up going to Cornell, but that didn't matter. What mattered is that to this day, I treat students with the level of dignity and respect that he treated me and priority because that's, without that, what are you doing? You're just making this own little world for yourself without anybody to come in and come in behind you. And for someone that famous to spend that much time with someone who he didn't know and who was I to him? That shaped for me what kind of human being I felt I should become as a scientist. And I feel it to this day. And another inspiration, I understand, uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Oh, <laughs> well, he's, he's, he's long dead, of course. Uh, it's not like we met or anything, but <laughs> yeah, Isaac Newton, just because his, you read his writings, you know, you just, it's almost spooky how connected he was to the operations of nature. And, you know, you can only dream about being a fraction as plugged in as he was, trying to understand how the world worked. And there he was discovering the laws of motion, universal laws of motion, universal law of gravitation, laws of optics. And it was on, practically on a dare when he was asked, why, the Ike, some friend of his, hey, Ike, why, why do, I don't know if they called him Ike, but I, I feel close to him, so I'm calling him Ike. <laughs> why, why do planets orbit in flattened circles rather than perfect circles? Because this was a kind of a mystery of the time. He said, I'm not sure. I, I'll get back to you on that one. And he goes home, comes back a few months, he says, here's why. So how'd you figure that out? Well, I invented integral and differential calculus to solve that problem. So he's, in, he's inventing calculus practically on a dare. And you see the power of his mind. It gives you something to aspire to, even if that aspiration is only a fraction of what he had attained. Nonetheless, it would be a magnificent life if you could do a fraction of what Isaac Newton could. And so he keeps me going. With all of the discoveries that have been made and with the fact that we're... Uh, on, on the cusp of, uh, of all of the new technology that's available, what do you see for the future uh, in terms of discovery? Yeah, you know, futurists usually overpredict the near-term discoveries and they underpredict the longer-term discoveries. It's a facet, because the longer-term discoveries are not just extrapolations of what you're doing today. They typically come about from the cross-pollination of areas of understanding that if you're just extrapolating, you're not connecting them. You just say, well, let's, if you do this today, you'll do three times that in five years or ten times. No, but when you cross-pollinate, whole new things happen. Whole new ways of doing business. Whole new ways of interacting with life. And so uh, when I think, as a scientist, I think of discoveries of our place in the universe rather than just a new widget that could be sold at the, at, at the video store. I'm eager to know if there's life on other planets. In our backyard, Mars, that's our, that's our backyard, get, get used to that. Backyard, Mars. Mars once had running liquid water coursing over its surface. Now it's bone dry. Something bad happened on Mars, by the way. I want to know what happened on Mars. I want to know where the water went. And when the water was there, I want to know if it once had life. If we go rummaging through the soils of Mars, will we find fossil remains of a once thriving biota? I, I want to know that. There's a moon of Jupiter called Europa, kept warm. It's too far from the sun for the sunlight to keep it warm. So it's, the surface is frozen, but Jupiter is pumping energy into the solid body, stressing it, and it pops back to shape. It's very slight, but it's noticeable, and it's a pumping of energy into the system and it melts the ice deep below. There's a liquid ocean, it's been liquid water for billions of years. I want to know if something's swimming around in that ocean underneath the icy surface of Europa. Once again, our backyard, or except maybe that's the neighbor's yard, a little further out in the solar system. So there are frontiers that I think can be answered within our lifetimes that I'm eager and chomping at the bit in anticipation of.
Is a Mars landing within reach for us? Yeah, oh yeah, so the next Mars landing is like we're sending a whole laboratory there. It's called the Mars Laboratory, basically. And it's, uh, it won't answer all the questions that I have in mind, but you know, you gotta take increments because maybe you'll learn something on this next mission that'll help you shape the next question that you ask. And if you shape the next question, next question, that shapes the technology you will use to answer it. So you can't do it all at once. That's just not how science progresses. What's your message uh, during your visit to Oklahoma State University? What's the one thing you want to impart on your audiences here? Uh, I would say, uh, you know, as an astrophysicist, I can be cliche and say, it's important to always keep looking up. That would be my message. Very good. Anything you'd like to add that I might have missed today? After keep looking up? I have to follow that now with something pro more profound? All right, let me think. How about, how about sometimes an investment requires an entire generation to realize what the return will be from having made that investment? And if you invest in technology, you get a widget next year or six months or within the, within the annual report of the company that did the investing. But when you invest in science, there's not a product at the end of your, the, the, the business quarter. There's not. But you're closer to a new understanding of how the world works from which new economies can emerge. An entire branch of physics called quantum physics at the time, it's like, what's that? Atoms and particles and they do weird things and who cares? That's the entire foundation of the technological revolution. The computer doesn't work without our understanding how quantum physics works and exploiting that fact in the operations of that machine. And the inventors of that were not thinking, hey, I'm going to make a computer one day. An electronic, no, that's not what they were thinking. They were just advancing the frontier of physics. So in your portfolio of what your nation is, yes, you always have artists and musicians that, that help flesh out the culture. It makes, it creates a nation that, that, that you enjoy living in, okay? That's great. But don't forget the different timescales of return of the kinds of investments you might, investments you might want to make so that you can live in the country that today we think we're living in but in fact are not. Dr. Tyson, we just scratched the surface, but it's a real pleasure okay. to meet Thanks. you. Thanks for having you. me on. Thank you so much. All right.